The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Boom. All right. Uh, so looks like we're going to have an intimate uh, stoa this evening, uh, which should engender some good conversations. Uh, I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the stoa. And the stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we have William Ferriello, uh, and he could, uh, um, yeah, okay, good. I got the salute. Uh, and uh, today uh, he's going to talk about his new book. And uh, we have a special MC, uh, my buddy, Michael uh, Tremblay. Uh, Mike is a, a PhD candidate in, the philosophy, in philosophy at Queen's University. He studies Epictetus, uh, and he's a practitioner in jiu-jitsu. I think he's a black belt, and, he's, and he has some MMA fights on him. It's up to you if you want to Google it uh, or, or look at it on YouTube. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to hand it to Mike right now, and Mike's going to introduce uh, uh, Bill, and then uh, we're going to talk, and then it's, uh, he's going to talk about the question and a protocol. So that being said, I will allow Mike to unmute himself and take him in. Great. So hi, everyone. Um, excited to be here, excited to do this, and uh, talk about this new exciting book with a great speaker. Um, so the way this is going to work, uh, as far as I understand, is I'm going to start off with a couple questions. With William, we're gonna have a back and forth. Uh, after the after that, we'll open it up to the chat. So if anyone has any questions during uh, Bill and I's back and forth, just write those in the chat, and then I'll uh, I'll queue you up and ask you to ask your question, and then you and Bill can can engage in that. If you wouldn't like to be um, on YouTube or like uh, be on the internet asking your question, you can just indicate that when you write it in the chat, and I can ask it on your behalf. Um, but other than that, just one at a time. We'll see if we can get up to some, some interesting uh, insights here. So uh, I guess to start off, uh, Bill, thanks for coming. This is great. Uh, you have your new book, God Bless the Broken Bones, coming out. Yep. And um, I guess to just get us started, if you could just run us through the main concept of, of that book and what you were trying to achieve with it and what you think it does. Yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the, uh, the offer, the opportunity. I also just found out that you and I have something else in common. I'm a massive UFC fan, massive MMA fan. I'm, I'm too old to do it now. I saw, I saw in your book you're talking about. is great. Yeah, um, I just saw, you know, just saw Colby and Tyron go at it this past weekend. There's two, two belts on the line Saturday for anybody else who's uh, interested in that kind of thing. And Adesanya versus Costa should be insane. So don't miss that one. But anyway, um, as far as the silly things I do are concerned, the important stuff is MMA. But let's talk about this nonsense. Uh, I don't know if you read this. God bless the broken bones. This is a, uh, a journal of one year, 365 daily entries. Um, and the, the entries are motivated by what I happen to have read that day, any news I happen to have encountered that day, um, conversations I may have had. So some of the entries are specifically about philosophy and even more specifically about stoic philosophy. Others are about various injuries that I suffer and uh, dealing with those. Others are about um, interactions I've had at work or interactions I've had outside of work. Uh, as I said, items from the news. So you get a year's worth of a journal from the perspective of someone who is uh, practicing stoicism slash cynicism and often failing, often um, woefully inadequate. I, I am woefully inadequate. You can tell by looking at me. Um, so, you know, I, I write down the struggles. Uh, I don't want to conceal anything. I don't want to present myself to my reader as uh, something that I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a stage, not even close to it. I'm a guy who is um, kind of grasping and stumbling. And occasionally I, I might uh, stumble into the light for a moment of clarity. And uh, hopefully there's a, there's a few moments of clarity in the book. Um, this is my sixth book. I've got a seventh one, another one coming out uh, next year, this one. Slave and Sage, this is directly about Stoicism, remarks on the Stoic Handbook of Epictetus. This comes out next year in May. Um, but whether you want to talk about that one or not, it's up to you entirely. I hope I didn't uh, drone on too long just then. So let oh, me know that's great. I, okay. 
Not at all. Um, and then I guess to get us started, because obviously the two of us are really familiar with Stoicism and Cynicism, but other people might not be. So I don't know, maybe like a quick 101 on Stoicism and Cynicism and maybe how they informed um, your practice and your journey in this book. Sure. Historically, the cynics came first. Uh, whether Antisthenes was the founder of cynicism or whether it was Diogenes or one of the others is a matter of some debate. All of the Hellenistic schools um, try to trace their lineage back to Socrates for obvious reasons. Socrates was a heroic philosophical figure. So the, uh, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Cynics, the Skeptics, uh, they all claim that they were following an example of Socrates, living life as he lived it, valuing what he valued. And of course, um, they can't all be right. Um, so the Cynics came first. Um, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, encountered the Cynics. And he encountered Cynic philosophy, which was uh, largely about, um, it was about the pursuit of virtue. But the fundamental idea is that the only thing we should concern ourselves with is virtue, um, gaining wisdom, becoming, uh, developing the other virtues, you know, courage, justice, fortitude, self-discipline, and all other social trappings were nonsense. Um, Diogenes famously coined the term uh, cosmopolitan, by which he meant, contrary to what some commentators say today, my view is, what he meant was that he was a Cosmopolitan means citizen of the cosmos. What he meant was he was subject to the laws of the cosmos, what we would call natural law, right? He, he had to obey the laws of nature, but as for the laws of man, as for civil law, he, he regarded those as nonsense. Uh, the social constructs were silly. They weren't to be taken seriously. And so he would do very uh, taboo, very shocking things. He would urinate in public. He would allegedly masturbate in public, whether that's true or whether that's something that was um, uh, presented by his adversaries to sort of make him look bad. That's, that's an open question. He would uh, eat in places where it was inappropriate to eat. He would insult people um, just for the sake of trying to wake them up. So cynicism was very much a sort of in your face lifestyle that directly challenged people to think about their values and to think about how they were leading their lives. When Zeno encountered cynicism, he thought, okay, uh, these guys are onto something, Diogenes, Crates, these people, they're right that virtue and wisdom, that's what we should care about. That's what's important, uh, our character and the, um, our efforts at self-rectification and all the rest of the trappings are kind of nonsensical. However, you're not going to get a lot of adherence. You're not going to persuade a lot of people by urinating in public and by calling them names and so on. So let's make a more palatable version of cynicism and from that, this attempt to make it more palatable, uh, you know, to make it the kind of thing that the average citizen might at least take seriously, might contemplate, might consider, uh, from that you get Stoicism. And um, of course, after Zeno, you get the, the great Stoics, you get Musonius Rufus, you get Seneca, you get Epictetus, you get Marcus Aurelius, and, and on it goes. Uh, again, hope I didn't drone on too long, but that's sort of the, the brief history of where it comes from. Yeah, great. And so one thing when I was reading your book that really struck me um, as a Stoic, someone who doesn't, I, I don't identify as much as a cynic, I saw, so your summary there, you know, was kind of cynicism as this rougher Stoicism or this Stoicism that, that is kind of in a pure form that hasn't been made palatable for the, the masses. And what I was getting at when I was reading your book was I saw a real emphasis on hypocrisy um, and an emphasis on maybe social convention, making people do things that doesn't make, doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, I guess if you could expand on that in your book um, and how that relates to cynicism in your view. Yeah, my, my stoicism definitely shades towards cynicism. Uh, Diogenes is as, as much of a hero to me as is Epictetus. Um, I, I do find there, there's something in me, I have a, a viscerally negative reaction to being told that I, I must say X even if I do not believe X to be true. Or I must refrain from saying Y, even if I think Y is true and is the correct way to express myself. The idea that I uh, should behave in ways that I find to be either ignoble or just silly or pointless because uh, I'm, I'm expected to behave in this fashion. 
other people and their expectations don't mean a great deal to me um, any more than they did to Diogenes. Uh, stoicism is sort of a decaffeinated version of, of cynicism. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't really want to be any more decaffeinated than I absolutely have to be. I, I don't go out of my way. Well, I don't always go out of my way to uh, offend people or irritate people, but uh, I, I, I don't overly concern myself with it either. I, I honestly don't even know exactly what this condition of being offended amounts to. It's allegedly a psychological or emotional state, but anytime I, I ask someone to describe to me what is this condition of being offended, I, I just get synonyms. They say, well, I'm affronted, I'm insulted, I'm aggrieved. Yeah, those are synonyms. W what is happening in your body and or your consciousness when you're offended and why should I care? Why, why, should, why should I concern myself with your mental states? I, I, I can't control your mental states. Uh, I don't ask anyone to concern themselves with mine. Uh, I've never in my life said, I'm offended, uh, other than, you know, to illustrate the fact that I don't know what it means. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a cynic, um, a cynic, cynical stoic or a stoical cynic or whatever. Yeah. Cool. Um, so when I was taking a look at the book, it's structured, as you said, as like a journal. And so there's kind of an essay for every day. And one thing you talk about in the introduction is that it's this process of like sustained attention or reflection. Um, so you're going to, you know, think about your life, think about what you're encountering actively and write about it. So, I mean, maybe if you could describe that process or what you learned differently in that year or how, how that, how that year went differently than a year that was maybe less reflective. Right. Um, I think the first thing, well, I don't know about the first thing. One of the, one of the things I realized early on, is how often I found myself um, behaving in a particular fashion because of expectations, other person's expectations or what I believe their expectations to be, rather than just saying what I was inclined to say, doing what I was inclined to do. Um, uh, how often I was, uh, I was presenting to other people a persona rather than the actual person that is me. And I began to wonder, how often do I do this? How often do all of us do this? And when you start asking, how often do we behave this way? And then you watch, for example, politicians, or you watch celebrities, you realize right away that for them, it's, it's virtually 24 hours a day. Certainly every time they're on camera, certainly every time they've got a, a microphone in their face, they're saying things that they don't really believe to be true. Or they're saying things they believe, but they're saying them in a way that is very um, uh, unnatural, very stilted, very uh, artificial. And you realize it's not just people who are on TV. Um, it's just about everybody. I mean, we're all constantly censoring ourselves. We're all constantly, um, I don't know, sort of governing, governing what we say and do in ways that I, I think are not particularly healthy and certainly are not necessary, um, or at least I don't, uh, no one has convinced me yet that they are necessary. Now, you know, I'm not suggesting that all, um, uh, all forms of manners, all forms of behavioral norms are to be jettisoned or something. I'm not gonna go to a funeral and start shouting curses or insulting the, the dead person. I'm not gonna do that. Um, there are things, there are terms we should not use because they've always and only been used in, uh, indefensible fashion. There, there are a lot, there are, you know, um, expressions of that nature, but not nearly as many as, as we're being, uh, as we're being told today. There's just, uh, political correctness in my view has just uh, gone utterly insane. Um, far, far too many, the, the speech police are everywhere and they are far too influential for my tastes. So uh, that's one of the first things I noticed is, geez, I'm, I'm awfully guarded and I'm, I think I'm probably a lot less guarded than most people are. And I notice how guarded I am. It, uh, I started to wonder about uh, how, how much we're just sort of pretending to each other, how much we're, you know, pretending to be people that we really aren't. And what would be the advice for getting rid of the persona or beginning to like engage in this process of being less guarded or more truthful? I would say you have to start with really brutal, brutally honest introspection. Um, 
when you are uh, when you are watching what you say, when you are behaving as someone else wants you to behave, you're typically aware of it. Um, sometimes we gloss over that aspect of our experience. We're, we're focused on others and on what uh, we think they want to hear from us. But if you, if you take a moment, either when it's happening or after it has happened, to introspect and ask, wait, was that me that I was presenting to this other person? Or was that just the decaffeinated version of myself, the more palatable version of myself that I was presenting? Um, I don't know how often most people are brutally honest with that kind of introspection, brutally honest with their assessment of who they really are. Um, we are, after all, we are a species of talking ape, right? I mean, we are, we are descended from uh, murderers and rapists and all sorts of people who, who survived long enough to procreate back before there were laws. And I suspect that surviving long enough to procreate was largely a matter of doing, doing things that are uh, for very good reason anathema today. We're, we're descended from beasts. We're descended from scavengers. We're descended from a predatory, uh, predatory set of ancestors. We can't possibly be as pristine as we often make ourselves out to be today. Um, at least I know I'm not. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and then, so there's this idea of beginning with radical honesty and, and introspection. Um, and so one thing you say in the introduction is like, you know, the, the author, I, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like the author of this book has problems. Yeah. And, you know, if you relate to the book, you probably have problems too. Right. Um, or relate entirely at least. And so I guess is part of that process also looking at the parts of yourself you don't like? Or oh, where is the, absolutely. where do you build that up with like self-improvement or like pumping yourself up versus? Well, yeah. it, it's difficult to improve oneself if you will not be honest about your flaws and your peccadillos and the places where you need improvement, right? And uh, that line in the introduction was semi tongue in cheek, but, but only semi, uh, I, I do have problems. I do need help. Um, I am sometimes an obnoxious jerk. Uh, I am sometimes needlessly abrasive. Um, and that does come out in the book. I, I don't want to conceal myself from my reader. Um, so there are lots of entries in the book in which I take myself to task. I say, you know, what a pathetic weakling you were today. And I describe some, you know, some occasion on which I, I let an injury slow me down, or I let the fact that I didn't sleep so well slow me down. Or I found myself worrying about had I contracted a cold or had I contracted the flu. And if you think about how pathetic that is, when you look at the common lot of humanity, even today, right? Most people on planet Earth live on the equivalent of two American dollars a day. Uh, you know, think about people who are facing real oppression, not first world oppression, but real oppression where they might be murdered at any moment. Uh, you know, you look at people living in uh, the developing world and, and what they have to deal with. And I'm, I'm going to be forestalled by, I'm going to be uh, slowed down by the fact that oh, I might have a cold or, or maybe my, my back is hurting me a little bit. You see um, military vets coming home from war, missing limbs right, or having been hideously burned or having PTSD so intense that, you know, every snap of a twig sends them into this intense fight or flight response. And oh, I'm, I'm going to bitch and moan about the fact that my my 52 year old back is a little tense today. I just I, that kind of weakness, I, I always find pathetic. And it's even more troubling when it's my weakness and I'm being pathetic. So I call myself on the carpet. Um, repeatedly throughout the year for doing things like that and, and other other stupid things just making stupid mistakes you know it's not a it's not a laudatory book regarding its author it's not me saying hey look at look at how cool i am it's like it's me saying look at what a wreck i am are you anything like me do you need as much help as i do uh it's that's the approach um it reminds me of epictetus but you're kind of like um doing that to yourself and, and helping along that process. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I have one more question and then I know Peter has a question, so we'll pass it off to him. Um, I guess the question is how you frame the book. So I, I was reading it and I was wondering like, is this, do you view this as, as 
like art? Do you view this as a self-help book for other people? Is this a philosophical project that you engaged in for yourself that you then might think inspires or helps other people? I guess, how do you, how do you frame the my, project? My approach was what I regard as the approach that Marcus Aurelius took writing the meditations. But then I'm not comparing myself to Marcus Aurelius. He's a far greater man than me and far wiser. Just the approach. Um, I'm writing down these thoughts in the initial instance, in the first instance, for my benefit. I, I'm thinking about myself, my flaws, various ways I should improve, the surrounding circumstances I encounter. However, uh, there are commonalities to the human experience. We, all, we are all flawed. Uh, we are all sinners, if you want to use that kind of language. We are all uh, faced with a world that is very large and powerful, and we are frail and ephemeral. We don't last very long. So if these reflections can be beneficial to me, and I believe they were, my hope is that they might also be beneficial to others. Um, and I, anyone from whom I've gotten any feedback about the book, the feedback has been interestingly uniform in one way. Everyone has said, there were times when I was reading this when I laughed out loud. There were other times when I was reading this that I found myself giving, giving the book the finger. <laughs> and there are other times when I found myself not really understanding what the point of this was, where I felt kind of lost. Um, and that's because I sometimes felt kind of lost and I was, I was writing down my thoughts about the fact that I'm, I'm a bit lost here. I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what the wise response to these circumstances is. I'm not, I don't know how to be virtuous in this particular case. Um, so it's a self-help book that starts inside here and hopefully, you know, moves um, to a more generalizable um, perspective Great. I think, I think there's a lot of value to seeing that process take place too. And not just, and also you're like, seems to me you had this idea of radical honesty and you don't want to, you know, pretend like you're the sage or perfect or anything like that. So part of it is, is this acknowledgement of being lost that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I guess I'll start passing it on to the chat room so we can get a, a discussion going. So if, Peter, did you want to start us off? Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I have, uh, I have actually three questions. Maybe I'll just ask uh, one or two. Um, so I've been journaling to myself every day since COVID came online and I've been doing it like maybe 150 days now as people in the Stoa know, and I found it, uh, is, is transformational and I've been doing it publicly too. So I've been like just releasing on my mailing list and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's like you, it's based off Marcus Aurelius's journaling practice. Um, so it's to myself technically, but I know people are going to read it just right away, like the night when I, when I release it. And so there's that dynamic of that kind of impression management that's just bubbling up all the time. And then kind of the, what it's really for, or at least what it, the pretense of it's for is to kind of that self-reflection transformation. So I wonder how you wrestled with that when you're writing it, I'm assuming knowing you were going to release this as a book. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the first one I wrote, my second book, but the first book of this nature that I wrote was this one, Meditations on Self-Discipline and Failure, Stoic Exercise for Mental Fitness. This one I did not know I was going to release. I was just doing what Marcus Aurelius did. I was just um, writing the journal for my own benefit. Um, I have a, 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 an anxiety and depression disorder that I apparently inherited from my dad. So I often struggle with those kinds of challenges. And I, I found that you know, bibliotherapy or journaling was a very uh, effective technique for getting my mind back under control. But after a while, I realized, I bet there are a lot of people who, who might benefit from this. I bet there are a lot of people who face these same challenges. And uh, because I was writing it to myself, I wrote in second person, right? Everything says you did the following today and you made this mistake. Um, so and, and I've, I've maintained that practice with every book except for this one. The only one that's not written in second person is A Life Worth Living. Uh, this is just a collection of articles that I've published in academic journals over the past 20 years. And uh, I did some research on that and found out that most academic articles are, are read by a grand total of seven people. <laughs> so what's the point? I, I decided to go ahead and put them into a format that was more accessible. Because I write in second person, I think some readers are a little bit, um, they find it a little bit abrasive, especially when I'm criticizing myself. If I say, if I write something like, you pathetic weakling, here's what you did today. 
Well, when you're reading that, and you, when you read the words, you pathetic weakling, you think, what, me? You're calling me a weakling? No, I'm calling me a weakling. <laughs> I'm just wondering uh, if other people might um, have the same kind of concerns about themselves, about their character. So uh, everything I've done, this is a long-winded answer your question. Everything I've written over the past few years has been, in the first instance, an attempt at self-help, literal self-help, trying to help this guy right here. And I hope it generalizes to be self-help for others as well. That's the idea. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. And so I have, I have uh, two more questions. I'll just sneak in both in right now and feel free to field which one resonates more. Um, so we talk a lot here at the store about like an ecology, what John Gray calls an ecology of practices. Uh, we have like a wisdom gym that's forming. Uh, so basically, don't just be relying on one life practice or spiritual practice. You have to have like a balance of a bunch of them in your ecology. And uh, and the, like as, as Michael and, and you know, like the modern Stoic community, there's no consensus of like how the Stoics actually practice, how you should practice. We all have our own bespoke ecology. Michael like uses jiu-jitsu as a form of Stoic practice. So I'm curious, besides the journaling aspect, what is your ecology of practice? That's one question. And then the other question is, is about the culture war. Because uh, you're, you're an open Trump supporter in California. Um, yeah. And so I imagine you get uh, um, <laughs> comments here or there. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I would argue, you might disagree with this, but I argue like across the political spectrum, people get emotionally triggered, especially when they're, they feel like they've been characterized wrongly. So do you, when that occurs to you, those cultural dynamics, how do you internally emotionally respond to it? Okay, uh, the first part of your question is about other stoic practices besides journaling, besides writing. Uh, yeah. I, I engage in the, uh, the practice of premeditatio malorum, that is, consider all of the sort of worst case scenarios, all of the seemingly unpleasant or disastrous possibilities that could befall you. So, for example, um, back when I was driving to work, I'm teaching online now because of COVID, um, I'm a terrible driver <laughs> because I'm a terrible driver. I often find myself in these circumstances that, that could be really frustrating or I have to slam on the brakes or someone, you know, either I inadvertently cut someone off or someone cuts me off. Before I would get in the car, I would uh, consciously think, okay, you're going to be commuting. It's about a 25 minute commute. You don't like driving. You're not good at it. Often when you're driving, other people irritate you and you often irritate other people. So gird your loins now, prepare yourself now so that if something comes up, you won't immediately be thrown into anger and frustration. You'll be able to be on that first instant. When you slam on the brakes, the first instant is just, but then you think, okay, all right, getting angry, getting frustrated, that's not gonna do me any good. Not gonna, not gonna help. Right? It's not gonna cause the traffic to dissipate, right? So. I would sort of remind myself in advance of the various things that could go wrong so that I can respond more rationally when they do. Just one example. Uh, I also do the, uh, the re review of the day uh, before bed. What did I do well today? What did I do poorly today? Um, what, did I, what did I not even encounter today that I anticipated? Um, our expectations are another thing we can work on governing, right? Um, I mean, consider this, this, uh, this interaction, right? If I came into this thinking, oh, I'm going to be on the, uh, the, the Stoa podcast, and now my book's going to be a bestseller because everyone's going to read, that would be an irrational expectation. Not, you know, you guys are cool, and I, you know, I like your show and everything. It's, it's but... totally not going to be irrational. Let me, let me say this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, the second part of your uh, question. Uh, yeah, being a being a Trump supporter, being a conservative, and I'm I'm a pretty hardcore conservative. I'm a, I'm a far right wing nut job. Um, out here in California, and especially being uh, an academic, uh, but I think I joked earlier that I'm one of three conservatives at my my college. That's that's not an exaggeration. Um, we actually had a, an interaction online over email the other day, uh, actually last week. I said, okay, look, if you don't think we have an, a, an ideological monoculture here at Delta College, let, let me issue you this challenge. And I said, look, I, Dr. William Ferriolo, am a conservative and a Trump supporter. I hereby ask all of the other faculty, full, part-time, everybody, who agree with me, who are also conservatives and Trump supporters, to respond to this email and say so in public. One person 
responded. One other person said, I'm a conservative. And they said, I voted for Trump, but I don't really like him. It's just that I really didn't like Hillary and I'm pro-life. Like, so don't give me a, don't give me a hard time about being, being a Trump supporter. It was this very sort of muted um, expression of conservatism. I got eight emails from people who said, Bill, I'm a conservative. I voted for Trump, but for God's sake, don't tell anybody. No matter what you do, don't tell anybody. Because they know that um, their job will immediately be in jeopardy. Uh, these were mostly untenured people, and they, they know that if they came out as uh, open Trump supporters, they would, there's no chance of them ever being tenured. Uh, I can tell you that I've, I've been on, I've been here for almost 25 years. I've been on many selection committees. Uh, someone who's openly conservative in an interview, not a chance in the world of getting hired, no chance. And um, the part-time people, they all said, well, if they know I voted for Trump, they'll just never give me any more courses. It'll be the equivalent of getting fired. And uh, I responded the same way I said, I, I understand entirely and you're right, don't worry, I won't, I won't tell on you. So um, yeah, I, I get a, an enormous amount of flack for being a Trump supporter. Uh, if you voted for Trump, you are of course a racist, a sexist, a xenophobe, an Islamophobe, a homophobe. And of course I'm not actually any of those things, but that is the immediate presumption. Um, stoicism comes in handy. Right? Being emotionally detached from being called those kinds of things and being labeled in that way and being psychologically, uh, able to psychologically distance myself from these uh, attitudes that people have about me, uh, it certainly comes in handy. And uh, I'm certainly much better able to deal with that now than I would have been, say, 15 or 20 years ago before I really got into the practice of stoicism. Cool. Thanks. Does that answer your question or? Yep. Right. By the way, if you want to uh, like, you know, lay send to me for being a Trump supporter and like, you know, call me stuff, feel free. <laughs> go, go right ahead. I won't get offended. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the after party. We will do that. Okay. All right. Fair enough. By the way, he's going to win in a landslide again. So just if, if you're betting, anybody on the betting websites, it, it's going to be around 321 electoral college votes for Trump. Guaranteed. Um, that feels like bait. That feels like you're trying. <laughs> um, Manu, you had a question. Did you want to ask, uh, Bill? Yes. Thank you. Um, I voted for Trump too. For good for you. But I don't really like labels. I'm not anything. I just I did the thing. Um, so cool. I'm wondering, how have you freed yourself, and or where have you refocused your energy? during the course of this rigorous self-reflection. I do self-reflect, but not in such a measured daily way for such a long period of time. And I'm thinking about how, the energy that it takes to put on a persona, the energy that it takes to be offended. Like if you've recovered that energy, like where have you redirected it? Uh, actually, that's a really interesting question. And it is true. Um, I have much more energy now that I'm just not uh, subjecting myself to uh, being angry and getting upset about what people think. Uh, I sleep better. I, my digestion is better. You know, um, it's, a, it's a much healthier way to engage with other people and with reality. Uh, I, uh, I direct the energy in a couple of different places. I, um, I started learning how to cook about four years back, and now I actually do most of the cooking. Um, at the time, my wife was working long hours, and I, I wasn't working uh, quite as much or a lot of my work was at home. So I figured that wasn't fair. I would start taking up the burden of cooking and I found I really enjoyed cooking. Uh, I work out a lot, um, I'm getting old, but I still try to try to work out, you know, five days a week or so. Um, a lot of yard work, a lot of sort of physical exercise to, to literally burn up calories and burn up energy. And I, I write a lot. I mean, I've written, um, what is it, five books in the past two years or something like that. So. I try to keep the mind busy. I try to keep this rapidly decaying carcass <laughs> that I call myself. Uh, I try to keep it from decaying more rapidly than it has to. And, um, you know, I, uh, I turn beef and chicken into uh, edible meals. They're mostly edible. <laughs> no, one's, no one's died yet. And, uh, that sounds like kind of a quotidian sort of banal answer, but that, that really is true. It's a, I work out, I cook, and I write. That's you know, how I spend most of my free time.
Yeah, and improved sleep and improved digestion. That's that's important stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, anxiety and depression are not, they're psychosomatic disorders. They're not just psychological disorders. I used to have uh, terrible problems sleeping. I always had really serious digestive problems. Um, I had lots of nagging aches and pains because I was always tense. I was always stressed. Um, I still have that stuff, but it's all maybe 25% of what it used to be. Maybe even, maybe even lower than that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hey, Will, thanks for uh, hosting Hi. the session. Um, what, what I'm curious about is I, I get this like feeling when you talk about like how much harder it is for just any other person than it is for, for you, you know, whoever you are. And in, in, in that moment, I get that feeling of like, oh yeah, like there's a shift in perspective that goes along with that. I feel like more energetic. I feel less bogged down by being stuck in my head. But sometimes when I'm on my own and I hear myself say those things like you're a pathetic weakling, I, I do not get the same shift in perspective. I feel more weighed down. I feel like it's like mere self-abuse and it's not giving me that shift in perspective that would make it constructive. And so I wonder if you have any advice for, for somebody who would like that shift in perspective, but sometimes isn't finding that the tools are delivering that. Absolutely. In the, in the beginning, I had the same problem. It just felt like self-abuse. And it really was just self-abuse. It was, you're, you're pathetic, you're stupid, you're weak, you're a loser. If that's where it stops, that is just self-abuse and you're just going to suffer. If, you, if, it, if it motivates a change so that you can actually be proud of yourself or feel better about yourself for having overcome one of your frailties, one of your flaws. If it's, instead of saying you're pathetic and weak, say, hold on you're being pathetic and weak right now, and you don't have to be. Right? Why, why don't you try this alternative? Here's a simple example. Um, I was cleaning up the garage a couple weeks ago, and I, I had to move some heavy stuff, and my back is always bothering me. I have, I have had my neck reconstructed, so I, I always have back problems. So I went to pick up this box, and it was bulky and heavy, and I went to pick it up, and I got this shooting pain right down the middle of my back. So I put it down. Uh, it was kind of an involuntary. I kind of dropped it. And I thought, well, this has to get done. My wife is five feet tall and she wasn't there at the time anyway. This has to get done. So I said, look, look, you're being a wimp. You're being weak. You don't let yourself be convinced that you can't move this box. You can move this box. You can do what needs to be done. It's going to hurt, but it's not as if it's impossible. Now, pick it up, move it, accept the pain. And when you're done, you will have done something worth doing. And sure enough, I picked it up, got the same shooting pain, moved the box, cracked my back, went back inside. And when my wife got home and said, did you clean up the garage? I said, yeah, I actually, uh, you know, I, I got everything where you needed it so you can, you can put your car in the garage now. So I had accomplished a goal that benefited my wife, the person I love more than anyone else in the world, um, by overcoming the initial reticence, the initial sort of physiological reluctance to do this thing. So the, if you don't want to, you know, use abusive talk with yourself, you don't have to. I say get to the point where you can move forward and accomplish goals and, and make something positive happen. For me, I'm an Italian guy from Jersey, so it doesn't bother me to call myself names. I, I grew up, I was the youngest of three boys. I got the crap kicked out of me every day. I, got, I was always being called stuff. It just, just doesn't bother me anymore. Um, you can take a different approach. Instead of saying you're a pathetic loser, you can say, oh, come on now. Come on now. You can do better than this. Right? Maybe that's a more viable approach for other people. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure. Great. So let's pass it on to uh, Elliot now, uh, if you want to ask your question. Is Elliot still there? Hey. Oh, there we go. Hey, what's up? Um, so I appreciate your, um, I guess, not being too precious about your own experience and, and not being <laughs> taking, too, taking yourself too seriously. I really admire that. Um, but when you talk about, I guess, the cynical side of, you know, um, what, what came off as like, you know, to hell with 
conventions and norms and all that. I'm wondering, you know, and this is something I'm, I'm sitting with in general, like the, um, the, the balance between the individual and their personal pursuit of personal development and, and how we kind of form a healthy society in general. And I'm wondering how, if everyone just eschews social norms or, um, you know, not all uh, rules or guidelines that are in place are there to control us. Some are there out of wisdom, like, you know, millions of years or thousands of years sure. of wisdom that's kind of been passed on through cultures. So I'm wondering how, you know, how would you design a healthy society incorporating your philosophy and approach, but still, you know, and, and I guess not to throw too much into your, your uh, put words in your mouth, but like, you know, how would you create a healthy society in light of um, having that, that uh, aversion to social norms? Right. Before I answer your question, has anyone ever told you that you look a lot like Greg Jackson? <laughs> you know, one, of the, um, one of the top MMA trainers at Jackson Winkle, Johnny trained John Jones. And there's this really uh, cool video. He used to train GSP back when GSP was champ. And there's mm -hmm. this really cool, really stoic slash cynic moment where GSP was fighting Josh Koshek and he comes back to his corner and he says, I think I tore my abductor. And Greg Jackson looks at him and says, oh, so you want to quit and give up the title? And GSP looks horrified. I said, no. I said, then don't tell me about it again. I want to hear about it. Right? We're fighting. We'll take you to the hospital later. Um, so <laughs> just, just made me think of that, that moment. He's um, a very handsome man. Yes. I'm sorry? He's a very handsome man. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Handsome devil. No doubt about it. Um, as for building a healthy society or, a, you know, uh, a better society, I am not convinced. I, I have no idea how to do it. No idea. I'm not convinced that it can be done given uh, current circumstances, especially, uh, I, I tend to think in the first instance about the United States. I live here. 330 million people. It's not clear to me that we even agree about the most fundamental values anymore. Um, we have become balkanized, sort of morally balkanized. We have become ideologically balkanized. I am not optimistic about the United States enjoying a cohesive future. Um, perhaps it can be done. I am betting on, I don't want to say collapse and dissolution. Um, I don't. I don't know that the United States as a unified entity lasts another 25 years. There'll, there'll be a place called the United States of America, but uh, whether or not it will be um, in practical terms, one unified nation as it was, you know, say 40 years ago, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. And I would argue it's unhealthy to worry about that, right? I can't make it happen. I, I can't conjure a healthy, well-functioning, streamlined nation into being. Uh, it's hard enough for me to keep myself well-functioning and streamlined and pursuing virtue and wisdom. Um, I think that uh, overly intense concern about socio-political matters is psychologically and emotionally unhealthy. Uh, look at what happened to half the country after the last election. I mean, you can j just, just go to YouTube and type in reaction to Trump election 2016. And you see people weeping, wailing, gnashing their teeth and then throwing bricks through windows. Obviously we have riots going on in every major city in the nation right now. Um, if that's a manifestation of concern about socio-political issues, I say maybe be less concerned. Um, work on yourself, work on conducting yourself in virtuous fashion. Now clearly if everyone did that, uh, we would have. A, a better nation, but the, the idea that everyone's going to do that or even a majority is going to do that is um, not plausible in my view. So I don't worry about um, those kinds of broad scale issues. Right? So my, my, my brief answer, how do we do this? I have no idea and I doubt it can be done. That's the, that's the honest answer. It's not satisfying, but I'm accustomed to leaving people unsatisfied. I'm married, you know. <laughs> I, if I saw it that way, I'd probably vote for Trump too. But um, 
So uh, do you have kids or are you thinking of having kids? Is that? I have three stepchildren. So yeah. I guess that would be the way I'd, I'd transfer the question. Like, how do you, you know, raise them, even in a household where they have to kind of live and coexist together? Um, where do you find that? Like, just be independent and do whatever you want versus. No, I, I, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Uh, I would never say do whatever you want. Um, not if whatever you want means acting on impulse and on our, you know, our, our best deal instincts. That's, that's not being virtuous. I encourage my children to um, develop their intellect. I encourage them to develop uh, the various virtues, to be courageous, to be uh, self-disciplined or temperate, to be just, to be fair dealing with others and with themselves, to be honest. I think honesty um, is, is one of the, um, one of the sort of central concerns that is either falling into disfavor or is being radically misunderstood these days. So I always encourage my children to be morally decent persons. Um, none of my kids could possibly ever get the impression that I think it's okay for them to steal or I think it's okay for them to uh, mistreat a woman or that it's okay for them to mistreat uh, a weaker person. Um, or that it's okay to you know lie for some kind of material benefit. Um, so I, I advise people to conduct themselves in virtuous fashion, uh, myself included. As for expecting others to do so, that's a that's a losing that's a losing gambit. You, you can't expect the public at large to be virtuous. It's to the best of my knowledge never happened. So I don't expect it. Thank you. Sorry, I was just cooking, so. That's okay. Hey, I like cooking. Thanks, Elliot. Um, we have a question from Theodore, which is kind of related to this, so that's a good uh, follow-up. Hey, hey, thank you. Hey, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a cynic as well, so I relate to what you're saying a lot, but, like, that's why this question is so interesting. So, as a cynic, and realizing that the human species has been here however long and has gone through way more tumultuous times than this. Yeah. Are you a Trump supporter, like at, to kind of be a heel to attract <laughs> negative vibes? No, no, no. Uh, um, I, I don't really understand most of the complaints about Trump. I, I don't see the evidence for some of these complaints um, maybe I have a blind spot. Maybe I just, I just don't perceive the alleged problems. I mean, look, I understand he's boorish. I understand if you look at the totality of his life, you know, he's, he's almost certainly an adulterer. He's almost certainly, you know, probably engaged in dirty business deals. It's hard to become a billionaire without, you know, cutting corners here and there. But I just don't see the man as the monster that some people make him out to be. Um, my primary, look, I, I supported Trump for two fundamental reasons. One is Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. I, I share no values with them, nothing, none. Um, secondly, I regarded him as the much more pro-life candidate, um, which is an important issue to me. I don't believe we should encourage, um, I don't even think we should allow, but much less encourage the slaughter of unborn human beings in the womb. And I knew he was close to being pro-life than she would be and would appoint Supreme Court justices that were more pro-life and uh, would hopefully eventually overturn the, the ludicrous decision that is Roe v. Wade. And finally, uh, I am concerned about uh, immigration restrictionism. And as soon as you say that, people say, ah, racism, I, I don't care where they're coming from. I don't, I don't care where, they, I don't care if immigrants are coming from, you know, uh, Asia, Africa, Europe, I don't care if they're coming from Canada. We've got 330 million people. It is impossible, in my view, to maintain a cohesive culture where we all share a sort of rudimentary set of base level values if we have no criteria about whom we allow in. Um, I, I think there's this, there's this strange kind of globalist cosmopolitan idea that if you cross a border, you take an oath, you become uh, interchangeable with any member of that society. Right? Here, here's a simple analogy. As far as I know, I've never heard anyone complain about the Amish. I've never heard anyone say, well, the Amish, they're, they're terrible people because they don't want us living with them. But they don't want us living with them. And I don't blame them, right? 
the Amish don't want me moving into their community because I don't share their values. I don't share their traditions. I don't share their history. I'm not, quote, one of them. And I probably can't learn to become one. Maybe I could, but probably not. If you have a community of, say, a thousand Amish people and a hundred people like me move in, that community has been destroyed. It will never be what it once was. Now, if you find what it once was to be objectionable, you might say, well, good, they shouldn't have been that way. But I can understand why the Amish want to be separate. They want, they want to have a community of people who understand each other. I think on a broader scale, it's very difficult to maintain the health of a nation if you don't have a community of people in, who in some fundamental underlying fashion understand one, each other, one another and, and share some basic facets of a worldview. And you just can't maintain that with open borders or de facto open borders. In my view, it can't be done. Um, and well, uh, I, I point to the current situation <laughs> as at least partial inductive evidence in support of my view. Um, it's chaos out there. It's people are literally shooting each other, literally at each other's throats. Um, well, so I'll add to that. Uh, so you said Trump will win in a landslide. And yeah, right. I don't have a dog in either fight because I'm, I'm a bit more cynical than you even. <laughs> but uh, you said he'd win in a landslide, but you still think that the country itself won't exist in 50, 60 years. So even yeah. if your views come to fruition, does it just delay things? Right. I, I, think, I think at most it delays the, the slide, the collapse, the, uh, the slouching toward Gamora. It delays it by maybe, I don't know, a couple of years. I think we're doomed either so, way. So if Biden were elected, it's sooner, but yet yeah, doomed either way. The, the question is, who will take us to hell at a slightly slower rate of speed? <laughs> I think Trump gets us to hell a little bit later than Biden gets us there, but we're, we're going to hell. If you look around, you say, why am I in this handbasket? That's where we're headed. Um, I don't think there's any way to stop it. I hope I'm wrong. Um, I also don't really have a dog in the fight. Like if, if I'm wrong and if Trump loses, I'm not going to weep well and gnash my teeth. I'm not going to go throw bricks through windows. Uh, I'll just say, oh, I guess I misread that one. Um, I, I'm not... I, I try not to be emotionally invested in the outcome of an election because I have no power. I, I live in California. My, my vote is epi phenomenal. Uh, let me let you know a secret. Biden's going to win California. <laughs> no matter what I do or don't do, Biden's going to win California. Just like no matter what anybody does, Trump is going to win you know, uh, Idaho. There, there are certain things that are not uh, plausibly malleable or, or subject to our, even our influence, much less our control. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about it, but um, it's a preferred indifferent for me that Trump wins rather than Biden. If it doesn't happen, yeah, life goes on. Okay. But, uh, uh, did I answer your question? I mean, I, no, no, yeah, you answered it perfectly. Yeah. No, I'm not trying to be a troll or anything. I, I actually think Trump is a, a better person for the job, but that's not saying much. Um, thank you. So we have time for one more question from Alex. Um, and I'll, I'll read this one. So how do you resolve the tension uh, between supporting honesty and supporting a president who lies is, is, is how the question is, goes. All presidents lie. All presidents lie pathologically. Uh, of course, Trump lies. Of course, Biden lies. Of course, Hillary lies. Of course, you know, W. Bush lies. Um, if you're going to vote for a president who never lies, uh, you're not going to vote. Right. There's, there's no such thing as politicians who don't lie. And I, I challenge anyone to present me, uh, you know, an example to the contrary. The question is not how can you vote for this li for a liar? It's, it's which liar do you prefer and whose lies are less deleterious to the culture at large? Whose lies? I see Trump lying more out of a sense of self aggrandizement. Trump is, he's very thin skinned. He is in some ways kind of immature. I don't perceive him lying about broad scale issues that actually affect the health and well-being of the nation. Right? Now you might, as, a, as a, an example of the contrary, you might say, well, he lied about COVID. I would say he, he, he tried to avoid panic about COVID. 
in the process of doing that, yeah, he did not exactly tell the whole truth. But I don't know that it would have been better for him to say, okay, listen, we've got a plague on our hands. Uh, according to initial CDC estimates, this thing is probably going to kill two to three million Americans. Just wanted to let you know that. It's very highly communicable and millions of you are going to die. But don't worry, we'll be okay after that. I don't believe that's wise leadership, right? I, I don't mind the way he handled it, downplaying it as he puts it. I think, you know, when, when FDR told, told the public, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, that wasn't true. It's never true that we have nothing to fear but fear itself, right? There was a, an economic crisis. There was a brewing uh, full-scale world war uh, in the offing. But you don't say, you, imagine the president said, look, look, our economy is in the tank. We're heading into a world war that we almost certainly can't afford. And we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of people. And we don't even know if we're going to win. The Nazis might win this thing. The Axis nations might win this thing. And our nation could very well be destroyed as a result of this, um, of this conflict. But don't worry, <laughs> we'll do our best. That's, that's not leadership. So yeah, Trump lies, they all lie. His lies don't bother me any more than Biden's lies. Uh, but, I mean, is anyone out there claiming Biden is not a compulsive pathological liar? The, the guy who literally lifted one of his speeches from a British politician from decades ago, the guy who claims he never spoke to Hunter Biden about his uh, work at Burisma and in China, um, the guy who just said the other day that there is no Supreme Court session between now and the election. Uh, now, he might be so senile, he doesn't know that the Supreme Court starts the first Monday in October. Maybe that wasn't a lie, maybe he's, he's just lost it, but certainly an untrue statement. And he's, he's made lots and lots of others. 200 million Americans will die by the time I finish this talk. I, I assume he meant 200,000, but you know, he's a liar, Trump's a liar. I'm, my, my business is for me not to be a liar. That's what I concern myself with. No, whether anybody else is, is really not my business. Thanks, Bill. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to pass it off to Peter to, to wrap up the session. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, anything you would like to leave us off with, uh, Bill? Like uh, things we can, uh, where we can find you, whatnot? Oh, I don't know why anybody would want to find me. Um, I'm, I'm not that interesting. If you want to find my books, go to uh, Amazon. You know, they're taking over the world. Uh, it's interesting how they're, none of the rioters have attacked any Amazon plants. Isn't that fascinating? They, they like to burn down small businesses. They don't like to burn down Amazon or Apple or IBM. Uh, I don't think that's a coincidence. But anyway, uh, off topic there. <laughs> you can go to Amazon. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go to the John Hunt Publishing website. You can order my books there if you want my books. Uh, if after hearing me and you know, sort of making my cyber acquaintance, you want nothing further to do with me, that's that's cool too. I'll be fine. Um, apart from that, I do exist in physical reality. Uh, please don't come in here and burn my house down. But if you want to just talk, <laughs> I'm in Lodi. Um, there's no reason to be particularly interested in me, though. Uh, I recommend reading the other Stoics, the other contemporaries who are writing about Stoicism, John Sellers. Massimo Piliucci, Donald Robertson, um, Chakrapani, a whole bunch of guys are putting out good stuff. Um, the guy who just wrote The Practical Stoic, his name is Ward. Yeah, uh, Franz or something, Franz Ward or something. Yeah, he might be coming out of the Stoa. Um, I was mentioning them to Mike. Well, anyway, the, the title of the book is The, uh, the Practicing Stoic. Right, uh, so right. Look for that one. That's a good one. There's lots of good stuff out there. Don't just read me. Right? No one else is reading me, so you know. <laughs> why, why should the people watching this do it? I like this anti-marketing strategy. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'll make some announcements in a moment. But uh, Bill, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for emceeing. Um, so upcoming events, we have well, one. Uh, we have a bunch coming up. One tomorrow, Peter Wang. He's a sense maker of residence. This is the last session. He's talking about the mental models he uses to navigate the complexity of life. Um, and then on Saturday, we have Michael Ashcroft coming in. Uh, he's a certified uh, Alexander practitioner in the Alexander Technique. And so that's at 12 p.m. Eastern time. The Alexander Technique is, you know, getting kind of an awareness of your, your bodily habits and your postures and how that affects you. So that's is that like similar to the, the Feldenkrais Technique? Is that like an offshoot of that? I think so. Maybe, maybe it looks like she says yes to that. Um, 
Yeah, so that's be cool. So if you want to check that out, uh, Bill, that's at the, you can RSVP there. It's on the website, the store.ca. We've got tons of events coming up. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so right there. Yeah, so everyone, thank you for coming out today. Thank you for uh, for inviting me. It, uh, 